every now and then I like to snoop in on other YouTubers who are doing wonderful interviews. And recently on Gnostic Informant's YouTube channel, he was hosting John Dominic Crossan. So I had to ask him, even though I took him off topic from what it was really about, was there really an empty tomb? Dr. Crossan is a Christian. He believes in Jesus, or at least to some degree, he has a biblical worldview. And he does believe in Christianity to some extent. But listen to his curious answer to my question. So Derek from Myth Vision has a super chat. Thank you, Derek. Everybody, if you haven't heard already, live under a rock. Myth Vision podcast is the spot. Go and subscribe. I'm sure 90% of you already are, but yeah, there's probably a couple of stragglers who aren't and go over there and subscribe. He says, was there really an empty tomb or is this a common mythological trope for divinized men? Love you all. Hit that like friends. So now we're no, in the new No, yes, and love you back. <laughs> no, no, you have to understand the background for a moment. I mean, if, if somebody picks up this story and has nothing to do with the matrix or where it comes from, it simply says there's an empty tomb and there's an empty tomb. Now, can we go back to the first century? Forget Jesus for a moment. He doesn't exist yet. In, in the first century, let's say the year zero, they used to call it the Y0K problem, I guess. The Y0K problem, the year zero, <laughs> as it were. There were two ways of explaining the exaltation of a very, very important person who had done something of extraordinary value for the human race. Two different ways. Two different ways of exaltation or vindication. And they're really different. They are profoundly different. One is called assumption or ascension. Greek word is apotheosis, divinatio. You've, got, you've almost used it there in, in your question. That was individual. For example, somebody like Romulus, who had founded Rome, let us say, was taken up among the gods when he died. And there was a little question there whether he had been assassinated and taken up or simply died and taken up or simply was taken up. So also for Moses, by the way, this is not in the Bible, of course, but it's in Josephus and Philo, founder of the, of the Hebrew religion, taken up to God. So that's called ascension. It is absolutely individual. We've no records of a whole family or a home tribe. Now, let me use another word. Not apotheosis or ascension, but anastasis or resurrection. Now, let it reverberate for a minute. We're quite used to saying, oh, resurrection of Jesus means he came out of the tomb and said, hi, I'm back. And if you were there with a the camera, you'd have got him and all the rest of it. Wait a minute. That's an ascension. <laughs> resurrection is not a commonly accepted concept in the first century, even among Jews. Ascension, it was taken for granted by the Greeks, by the Romans, by the Jews, that this is a possibility. You could be taken up to the gods or taken up to God, like, like Elijah, very holy person or very powerful general could be taken up among the gods, what you call a, a divinized men. There weren't too many divinized women. There was a few of them, but the men were doing most of the divinization. Now, what was resurrection? Forget Jesus. He doesn't exist yet. Right. If you use that term in the first century, what did people think you were talking about? It is a sectarian Jewish term used only by the Pharisees at that time, at least. Interesting. The Sadducees were quite happy with the world the way it was. Thank you very much. Everything is fine. And besides, we don't find this in the Bible, so we don't believe it. The Pharisees insisted on this. And here's what's crucial about them. This world is a just place. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> I don't. What about the Assyrians, Babylonians, Medes, Persians, Greeks, and Romans? Where's the justice? The Pharisaic thing is at the end of time, there's going to be now three things, a general resurrection, the whole human race is going to be brought back to life, every single individual. And then there's going to be a general judgment. And then there's going to be an effect, heaven or hell. 
So the world is a just place because at the end, this is a sectarian pharisaic belief that Paul would have had, for example. At the end, God's going to clean up the mess of the world by establishing the whole human race to see the justice of God and then the general judgment. Now, resurrection is a shorthand term for that Trinitarian phenomenon of resurrection, judgment, sanctions, heaven and hell. Now, do I for a single second believe that's going to happen? Of course not. I mean, people I'm sure even talking to the Pharisees, you will remember that joke, uh, they, they hit Jesus with, well, what about, what about a uh, woman who's had seven husbands? Ha, 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 comes the resurrection. She must be very busy, right? They have seven husbands. I mean, people can do the same thing. You mean, if somebody has been eaten alive, what about cannibals? You know, what I take with deadly seriousness is not that, but that whether there is justice in the world or not. I do. And I'm absolutely, I don't mean there's creepy little things we know. I simply mean that we're talking about the human species. Yeah, somebody over here may get away with it. A bad person who gets away with it. Somebody over here, a good person, and it seems that they were in an accident. Yeah, I know all of that stuff. But it seems to me that right now in our world, we can look at what we've done to the world by assisting global warming <laughs> to do so fast. And every single one of us, including myself, even though we know we don't do, we don't do this, we don't do that. The human species is what we're asking about. Is there going to be like a great big judgment of the human species? Not in any literal sense, but supposing, for example, we found out to our own fault that we are no longer in a sustainable world either to violence or to, to <laughs> what we did to the environment. Right. Suppose we found that out. That would mean now that the story, the trajectory of the human species, all back to far back as you want to go, 70,000 years ago when we came out of Africa <laughs> and sort of declared war on the world. That means we've been a failure. As a species, we are an endangered species <clears throat> and we have destroyed ourselves. So whether there is a judgment on our species, and I really am not trying to pull God into the back door, and please, I'm not. I'm trying to take evolution with deadly, I mean deadly seriousness. That the question is not whether oil is sustainable, but whether our species is sustainable. Please remember, 70,000 years ago, Homo sapiens, our individual species. It's ironic that we are called sapiens, which means wise, because it's not that clear. Came out of Africa, and it would be fair to say, I think, we declared war on the world. We started on the environment, and we started on other species, and we started on ourselves. Now, whether we can sustain such a species in a world is an open question. And so I am asking us, whatever religion, whether you're a theist, an atheist, a monotheist, a polytheist, this God, that God, please think of evolution. <laughs> because evolution for me is kind of like gravity. I don't think it matters anything whether you believe it or not. If you go up to a 50 story building and step off, you're going to die. And it's not that God hits you with the pavement as a punishment. And that's going to happen to polities, atheism. Evolution is there. It's not a matter of belief. It's a matter of, I don't know, if you want to say acceptance, I suppose. I don't know what I think pretty, I just, it's pretty clear. Yeah. It's, given. it's a given. You can you can certainly refuse it. You can certainly say, I don't believe in gravity and act accordingly. And then what happens, happens. It's a consequence, it's not a punishment. So what I'm really after is resurrection. So to declare, as Paul does, by the way, that this great big general resurrection at the end of time 
he calls it the anastasis necron, the resurrection of the dead, begins with Jesus. What the heck does that mean? That the general resurrection begins with Jesus? Well, I think what it means for me is that Jesus lived a programmatic life of nonviolent resistance and was executed for it, fairly enough from the Roman point of view. That's what we do with people who create turmoil among the people. We know he's not armed. We know he's not a armed rebel. We want, otherwise there'd be 12 crosses up there. But we execute the leader. That's what we do it with um, nonviolent groups. We execute their leader to teach them a lesson. So that inaugural act of injustice haunts our civilization. Not as Christians. I'm not talking about that, that at all. I'm talking about violence and nonviolence, violent resistance, nonviolent resistance as the archetype to solve that problem that goes back, as we talked before, to Cain and Abel. And whether we as a species, since we are so good at improving everything, whether our steady improvements on the instruments of violence, I, I don't think we're getting more evil. I just think we're getting more dangerous. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so we, sorry, go on. Go on no, you made some really good points. And that's like, if you want to look at judgment in the sense of, like, like you said, like, let's say we do wake up one day in a po post apocalyptic world because of nukes or something, like Russia sends a nuke or something. I don't know. Something happens. That, in a sense, if you actually look at it, this is, that's, we, that's judgment. It's a sense, it's a type of judgment on the behavior that we as a, as a, collective world yeah. have, have created now the question i'm sure a lot of people watching this right now are probably thinking how do you get this message into churches because most of these real fundamentalist american baptist churches they don't want to hear this this is this world is something to hate this world is no good we're going to get out of this world and uh who cares about climate change who cares about all that well what do you how do you how do you maneuver how do you get this to be more mainstream well, I, I'd start with a very simple one. Do you or do you not accept the statement, God so loved the world? <laughs> Let's start with your favorite one. I did just stop for a moment. I, I'm not bracketing out. I really am not bracketing out the sun. <laughs> the reason why I left, the reason just, why I left is because when I was leaving my church, one of my friends that I was like, <laughs> my best friend basically from the church, we had a big back and forth for months discussing me and what, what I'm doing, why I'm leaving. So we're debating the Bible. We're debating it, like all this stuff. And I said that to him. I go, cause he, I was like, you think the world is something to hate, but what about this verse right here? Yeah. God love the world. So that's why when you said that just now, I was like, Oh man, this is awesome. All right, but I don't mean to cut you off, but I just wanted to throw that in there. I mean, you're, you're quite, it's the obvious one. <laughs> There's a, a local pastor, nothing against him. And he advertises on, on the cinema. Remember cinema? The thing we used to go to once upon a time. He advertises and he says, God so loves you. Now, wait a minute. You could say God loves me, but he mightn't love you or them or the world. It could just be, you know, we're just here in this kind of dump. If you, if you begin with the world, of course it includes us. You can't say God's... God loves the world, but he doesn't care about people. That's it's absurd. The world includes them. So if you start there with a big picture, then it certainly includes all the small pictures. But if you start with the small picture, you can forget about the big one. So I would start there. And then if you want to go back to Genesis chapter 1, I mentioned this before. Let me underline it. As I understand it, after the exile, when the Persians told the Jews in Babylonian exile, go home. We're funding you to go back home to set up your country, fix up your city, and get your law back. The Persians kind of invented um, the martial aid before times. You know, they're right. The Persian idea was we don't want to hit you every springtime and loot you. We're going to send you home, set you up, and tax you. It was much smarter than the Babylonians who kind of, yeah, they would take taxes too. But if, So the Persians sent them back. Now, they're putting together their Bible, as it were, their sacred traditions. And that's what we were talking about before, about the, the proto-stories and everything else. 
But Genesis 1, it's actually Genesis 1 to 2, 4, 8, but the, we call it the first creation story, was created, if you want to put a date on it, in the 500s, to be the prologue of the Bible. It wasn't written first, in other words. God it, said it was good. Yeah. So they're drum, drum beating in that. And watch a couple of things. At the end of that, humanity, and it's very careful to say <laughs> male and female because they're trying to probably cool a bit of the overbearing male stuff that's got them in, into all the trouble they <laughs> got them into in any case, male right. and female. So you think well, that's deliberate to say that because you might take it for granted, except <laughs> you, you don't need. We're made in the image and likeness of God. Then immediately that's explained as we're put in charge of the world, like God's um, ambassadors or stewards might be a better word. We're put in charge of the world. And in case you think, well, what does that mean? The very next thing is the Sabbath. And the Sabbath in the Bible means basically that's what it says. It says everyone has to get a rest. You know, if, if you have slave laborers, you have to feed them. Otherwise, they'll die. But you don't have to give them any rest. So the insistence on the Sabbath day is not so everyone goes off to the temple or the synagogue or whatever. It says quite clearly in Exodus and Deuteronomy, so that your sons and your daughter, your male and female slave, your ass and your ox, even the draft bill beasts get a day off. So the, the rhythm of history, now we have calendars and watches and all that stuff. How did they know a week? Well, <laughs> they knew a week because of the Sabbath. And how did they know a Sabbath year? Well, the Sabbath year, every seven years. So and then Sabbath Jubilee every 50th year. So they've structured time to the beat of justice, fairness and distribution. Everyone needs rest. Everyone needs a land, for example, uh, freedom for slaves. All the stuff that's in the Sabbath tradition is set up from that opening in the Bible. And what's fascinating about, for me at least, in that first chapter, as distinct, say, from the last chapter in the Torah, say, Deuteronomy 28, there's nothing about punishment. Say, excuse me, God, supposing I don't want this image and likeness or refuse to accept it or refuse to abide by it or won't cooperate, you go to punish me? It's not even mentioned. Not even mentioned there because there's consequences, not punishments. If... If we're made in the image and likeness of God, according to the Bible, and we don't act accordingly, we'd be punished? No, it's self-destructive. It's like, as I said, go back to my 50 stories and think you're a bird and see what happens. Yeah. So we have, we have the opening vision of the Bible in Genesis 1 kind of mitigates or almost contradicts the closing of the Torah, the first five books, which is in Deuteronomy, all about punishments. Do this, you get punished. Do this, you get rewarded. That's all about it. So the Bible is able to think about itself and rewrite in retrospect. Sure. Makes sense. That was a really good, really good uh, answer and good question, by the way, but I appreciate that. <laughs>